Let's pretend it's the end of this whole ugly story. We vanquished the foe and we triumphed in glory. There's nothing but rainbows and blue skies ahead. Hallelujah, amen, it's the end. We threw off the yoke and we broke all the shackles. We tore down the walls and we burned down the castle. The oppressors all scattered and naked they fled. Hallelujah, amen, it's the end. Welcome to Before the Future Came, a Star Trek podcast. We are looking at the utopian ideals of Star Trek as we voyage from one work to the next, following a breadcrumb trail of motifs. This month, we're talking about the two-part premiere of Star Trek Discovery, The Vulcan Hello, written by Brian Fuller, Alex Kurtzman, and Akiva Goldsman, and directed by David Simmel, and Battle at the Binary Stars, written by Brian Fuller, Gretchen Berg, and Aaron Harberts, and directed by Adam Kane. I'm Melissa, and if a death was necessary, I am satisfied it was not yours. I'm Lucy, and I was a human who had seen a life of loss, but still chose hope. I'm Gregory, and you're right, I may not be myself. Last episode, we discussed the Star Trek Voyager episode Relativity, which had a strong mentorship relationship between Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine. Today, we're talking about two Star Trek Discovery episodes, The Vulcan Hello and The Battle at the Binary Stars, which also have a strong mentorship relationship between two femme characters. Lucy picked it, so please give us a summary of the episode in your own words. Why, thank you. I would be delighted to do so. <laughs> uh, these are the first two premiere episodes of Star Trek Discovery, which, if you don't know, are set before the events of OG Star Trek. So kind of a prequel to the original Kirk and Spock, which is important because Spock and his family come up in this. And and this was the first Star Trek TV show that existed for a decade or two uh, since Star Trek two. Enterprise. Yeah, yeah at least a decade. decade. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to start with the Vulcan Hello. First officer's log... Star date 1207.3. The Klingons have gathered to unite under Tukovma, who encourages the Empire to remain Klingon and know that the Federation is the enemy because they come in peace. Before we can make sense of these new old Klingons, we cut to Captain Giorgio and her number one, Michael Burnham, slogging through a desert, who offer, in about two minutes of footage, all of the Star Trek answers we've longed for in decades of Bechtel pop quizzes. <laughs> They're on an away mission. It's pretty cool and not all that important, except to establish that Giorgio is intrepid and Burnham is competent and they respect the hell out of each other. Well, actually, it's a microcosm of Star Trek Discovery as Burnham and Giorgio attempt to help the people of this planet without being observed in order to maintain Federation protocols. And of course, they're immediately observed. And they also leave a giant Starfleet emblem inscribed in the sand, which is definitely the sort of thing that we know from watching Star Trek. Will resort in, resort, ugh, which is definitely the sort of thing that we know from watching Star Trek will result in a Starfleet-centric religion over the next 100 years. Just kidding. <laughs> this scene was extremely important. This is a very long summary. <laughs> <laughs> now the Shinju is investigating some deep space relay that has been fucked with science officer lieutenant saru identifies an unidentified object that may have chawed the relay but without a shuttle they have no way to get close to it burnham volunteers for the very dangerous mission to head out in a spacesuit which is how she discovers that the object is an intricate sculpture she then discovers a humanoid form bearing klingon iconography and a batleth they attack Burnham, who defends herself, killing the apparent Klingon, but spinning off into space herself. Burnham dreams of her childhood on Vulcan, and the anxiety of taking a test that triggers your PTSD. Very relatable. It turns <laughs> out that her adopted daddy is Sarek, a Vulcan dad with whom we are already familiar, since he's also... Dun dun dun. Spock's dad. When she wakes up in sickbay... Burnham immediately jumps up, covers up some weird space swaddling that even Burnham in a rush does not wish to wear to the bridge, and heads up to warn Giorgio about the Klingons. 
Despite no physical evidence of Klingons, Giorgio trusts Burnham's word and goes to red alert. Once they ready weapons, a Klingon ship immediately uncloaks and does not respond to communications. Meanwhile, the Klingons argue about who will be the torchbearer, an important role in this new order of the Klingon Empire. Although Voke, an albino Klingon who calls himself of no house, is an outsider, he wins Takovma over with his pain management techniques. <laughs> Back on the Shinzu, Giorgio confers with an admiral, Burnham breaks the chain of command by speaking to said admiral, and Giorgio is ordered to stay in place until backup arrives. Burnham calls Sirik long distance to ask what he thinks about Klingons and learn more about how the Vulcans interacted with Klingons. Burnham, armed with knowledge, which as we all know is power, returns to the bridge to confront the captain with her plan to attack the Klingons in front of the whole bridge crew, which is a well-known successful strategy for getting captains <laughs> to do what you say. Privately, Burnham attempts to persuade Giorgio to use the Vulcan hello, which is not a sex thing, but a preemptive attack. <laughs> I know, I couldn't remember the details either. <laughs> when Giorgio refuses, Burnham Vulcan neck pinches her and then takes control of the bridge, ordering the Shinju to fire on the Klingon ship. Giorgio, not one to take a pinch lying down, returns to the bridge and belays Burnham's order. Just then, 24 Klingon ships show up surrounding the Shinju. End of episode. Now we go to Battle of the Binary, no, Battle at the Binary Stars. This is the same day and the same log, but now it's the first mutineers log. <laughs> <laughs> In a flashback, a more Vulcan-seeming Burnham beams aboard the Shinzu with Sarek, who introduces her to Giorgio for the first time. We learn that Burnham is joining the crew, and Giorgio wins her over by recognizing Burnham's strength and matching her energy. They tour the bridge, which is functional. In the present, Giorgio is not admiring Burnham's mutiny, though she is quickly distracted by 24 Klingon ships surrounding the Shinjo. Burnham immediately grokks that 24 is a significant number that likely represents all the houses of the Klingon High Council and the potential reunification of the Klingon Empire. She is immediately remanded to the brig, and then at least partly vindicated to viewers who see Voke addressing the representatives of the Klingon houses who are irritated at having their evenings disrupted by this reunification situation. Takovma, it turns out, wants to unify the Klingons by embracing their singular Klingosity and by leveraging a snappy motto, Remain Klingon. Now, many more Starfleet ships show up in answer to Giorgio's earlier calls. Confident of backup, Giorgio hails the Klingons and offers a dichotomy, leave or chat. Takovma offers the counterpoint of opening fire. The Shinju endures a lot of hull damage, including hull damage to the brig, where Burnham is trapped. She has a long-distance mind meld with Sarek, who basically tells her that she better live long and prosper or she's going to catch it from Daddy. Burnham seems hardened. <laughs> After sustaining such damage, the Shinju veers toward an asteroid which they can't evade. Happily, the Europa, bearing the pre-aforementioned Admiral, arrives and saves the Shinju with a trapdoor beam. The Admiral then negotiates a ceasefire with Takovma, but unfortunately a ceasefire to Takovma means that a Klingon ship uncloaks and plows directly into the Europa. The Europa Technically it did not fire. It just it kind not. of crashed. It just sort <laughs> of drove true. forward and blew up the ship. You're right. I do not think Takovma lied, technically. <laughs> the Europa releases its antimatter containment field, reducing both ships to space rubble. Takovma seems satisfied with these events, and sends the 24 house ships back home to their regularly scheduled Netflix and chill, Paramount and chill, evenings, <laughs> but against the Federation. Indeed, all of the Klingon ships except Takovma's immediately leave, which puzzles Giorgio and Starfleet. Saru comes up with a plan to harm the Klingon ship with a photon torpedo, which they can't autopilot. Giorgio says that she will take up the suicide mission and steer the torpedo. They observe, however, and see the Klingons are gathering their dead from space. This inspires a new and improved plan to hide the photon torpedo in one of the corpses. <sighs> this gambit works, and the Klingon ship sur suffers tremendous damage. Giorgio determines that she will beam over to the Klingon ship and kill Takovma in retaliation for the harm he has caused. Burnham convinces her that this would make him a martyr and that they should capture him instead. My, how the tables have turned. Giorgio and Burnham beam over to the Klingon ship to capture Takovma. Things immediately go awry. Giorgio and Takovma the Unforgettable, whose name I have to look up every time, have an honorable battleth fight. 
Burnham and Voke have a nasty fight, which Burnham wins because she is nasty when I say that <laughs> with love. Burnham <laughs> defeats, but doesn't kill Voke, and arrives to the Giorgio Tukovma fight in time to watch Giorgio get impaled. Burnham shoots Tukovma, who later dies in Voke's arms, a martyr. My, how the tables have turned again. Burnham is tried and convicted for mutiny. She is sentenced to life in prison. So I guess Discovery was just a two-episode series. That's it. She goes to prison forever. I, I remember watching this the first time and being like, "Where? What's this? Where? Where's the series? They blew up the ship, and the captain's dead, and our apparent main character is in prison. Why was this the premiere? It just feels like a movie. And this time it was like, yeah, it feels like a the best Star Trek movie, like." It's one of my favorite Star Trek movies, in part because it's a bummer. I was devastated. I remember vividly how I felt when Georgia dies the first time I was devastated. She was what I wanted. She was the captain I wanted, you know? Um, yeah. I was so upset about it. There's an important thing you didn't mention about Georgia, which is something that makes her uh, even more appealing as a captain, which is the person who plays her. Michelle Yao? Yes. That, that I just... love her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I was also, I mean, y'all probably noticed that moment when uh, Giorgio and Burnham meet eyes on the bridge and she just trusts Burnham is just yeah. like that moment when Jamie looks at Seven and mm -hmm. just trusts Seven. So that was, I feel very happy that the moment that I was imagining was real. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we each brought a topic for discussion. Uh, my topic is that this two-parter is just michael burnham's worst day uh <laughs> previous star trek series have been always talked about as ensemble stories they've had a large collection of characters we've talked about how uh, last episode how voyager kind of feels like it has too many characters and like any given episode might be about it usually has an a plot and a b plot that's about a certain group of characters and they all sort of have equal billing right the the captain is almost always kind of more prominent and there's definitely like a, a lower tier of people like lieutenant barclay and people that like show up occasionally um but this is about michael burnham it we she is our viewpoint character in everything except the klingon stuff in which case basically voke is our our viewpoint character for that and uh like the other main characters are Giorgio and Saru, period. So maybe in part because this was the first Star Trek in a long time, there's a lot of stylistic things they do differently. And the, the choice to like make this a series that is about a, a protagonist is very new to, to all of Star mm -hmm. Trek. And at, kind of as a result of that, that, um, that structure to the story, so much of this story, story in the script is about burnham's personal journey uh there's a, a whole lot of lines that relate directly to it and and in short uh burnham is uh lost she does not know how to motivate herself and she uh keeps looking to external sources to validate her and to tell her how to live her life and always gets betrayed or abandoned or uh is disappointed in the people that she chooses to follow and mm -hmm. as part of this we're going to talk about a lot of things that happen throughout the series of discovery i don't think that we're going to like spoil big reveals probably but like we're going to talk about stuff that happens it'll be fine you'll still enjoy the series if you want to watch it um but burnham's life story is she was born to a couple of scientists who are working on a top secret cia project on time travel they get attacked by klingons her parents are apparently killed she's rescued by vulcans becomes sarek's ward the vulcans do nothing to treat her ptsd just tell her suppress all her emotions sarek is distant which we'll talk about later and then her school is bombed by logic extremists who are, aren't even angry about her. They're angry about her adoptive brother, Spock, who is half human, half Vulcan. She learns to suppress all her emotions, wants to get into the Vulcan space core, 
Sarek sacrifices her career in the Vulcan Space Corps in order to get Spock a guaranteed seat, which Spock never takes because he joins Starfleet. She gets foisted off on the Shenzhou. She doesn't go to Starfleet Academy, as far as I can tell. <laughs> she's she's like a transfer over from mm. Vulcan schooling. So like she's an outsider there. She latches onto Giorgio, who like remember, she lost her mother. She doesn't really have a mother figure. Her, her relationship with the, with Amanda, who is Sarek's wife, seems to be much more distant than her relationship with Sarek. She um, does. I I watched episode. Uh, three and four today and she does talk about her relationship with amanda they were reading alice in wonderland that's right and yeah. that does mm-hmm. seem like they do have at least some sort of relationship yes that's true but there's there's definitely she's definitely looking for parental figures throughout um so Giorgio dies burnham essentially gets Giorgio killed uh she gets a new captain that captain turns out to be a bad guy not a spoiler it's obvious from the very first episode in which she <laughs> shows up uh she f- encounters an alternate version of Giorgio who is evil uh she learns that her mother through time travel shenanigans is back and her mother isn't really interested in reconciling but has other stuff going on she's constantly following stars throughout this uh and it's only once she leaves everything in the entire world behind including a starfleet which has betrayed her because it has been taken over by an evil ai that she's finally just kind of able to be alone free of any any uh responsibilities and like the first episode of season three is maybe the first time i feel like we see her truly happy uh her lover in the first two seasons ends up being a big complicated betrayal it's really rough and we from the very beginning we hear uh one of Giorgio's first lines burnham's like like i think i i think we just need to go this way and Giorgio's like that doesn't change the fact that you're lost Giorgio says follow my footsteps michael even lines it's your turn to trust me you can't set a course without a star is a thing that burnham says and then Giorgio says i set a star and we're constantly getting this idea of like Burnham is looking for something to guide her, and there's all the star imagery. the uh, the The light of Kailash is the the beacon that gets lit to summon mm-hmm. the the Klingons, and it serves as a guiding star. In fact, even when when Sarek has the conversation, the long distance phone call, he says, "You know, reports are that a new star has mm-hmm. <laughs> has been seen in your sector, and it's that beacon." When mm-hmm. Burnham when they're trying to figure out what the beacon is it's 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 got a screening field around it it's not really cloaked but it's cloaked uh and burnham says maybe it's lost maybe it's afraid to show its whole self uh Mm -hmm. and burnham herself is sort of like um she's fitting in on the shenzhou but she's still very like sniping at people she pushes saru out of his own station in order to take over and do something herself um she's still like trying to prove herself after seven years on this ship she's still kind of jockeying for her position um she immediately uh immediately disobeys orders during her space flight uh and that's also the only time we really see her happy in this entire episode is when she's alone in space just flying and having this visceral sensual pleasure of flying fast uh and i'll just say for anybody who watches this really enjoy that moment because you're not gonna see michael happy again for a while yeah (laughs) and and she she says i I quoted in the beginning she says i may not be myself uh around the mutiny um she uh sarek mentions that when uh, civilization acts in opposition to its instincts it may be under the influence of something or someone new which also applies to burnham right like burnham is acting against her own nature repeatedly because of this guidance that she's seeking from others it's so interesting because i was really thinking about the same thing that you were um pointing out about the choice to really tightly focus these two episodes on burnham Giorgio, and saru i think um it's so different than what star trek normally does Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but i do think especially since i watched ahead a little bit i think it because if things are so complicated i think they really needed to have that sort of tight narrative focus like we need to understand 
this relationship that Burnham and Giorgio had. And we need to understand how Saru and Burnham interact because Saru is going to be so important on Discovery, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. he's crucial. Yeah. Yeah, because this because this uh, this thing is all about her, that we're able to do a thing which Star Trek really hasn't done very much of at all. Star Trek is usually competence porn, right? Star Trek is usually a bunch of very skilled people maybe occasionally making mistakes but generally making the right decisions and demonstrating their skills and this is a very skilled and competent and gifted uh person who just makes all sorts of mistakes with regard to herself and with regard to the people around her um and because she is lost because she does not she is not providing her own guidance but is always looking for a star and that's an interesting thing for star trek to be doing because star trek is very often talking about like follow the prime directive follow the mm -hmm. the chain of command trust your your fellow uh shipmates and she doesn't hear or or she when she does she does it wrong and it hurts her yeah. and that's that's interesting and the 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 like her coolest moment in this epi in these episodes, I think, is her escape from the brig. Um, yeah, that moment, like, I I had not remembered that. Um, it's it's it opens with that incredibly tragic uh, Connor being pulled out into space, and then she has to like logically convince the ship computer that like letting her out of the brig is important because if not she'll die, and then she like has to launch herself through space into this airlock in order to, to survive and that's like both mirroring her earlier space flight and also like it's only when burnham is alone that she seems able to be like comfortable and confident when she doesn't have to prove herself yeah and I, th I think there's interesting contrast later in the series when she finds herself alone less by choice <laughs> like because she's been betrayed by a lover or because you know something like that where there are some scenes later where you'll see this kind of kind of shell-shocked war weary mm -hmm. look on her face that is like yep i'm alone and it it looks different than this kind of alone where she's yeah. you know thinking on her feet yeah you know i think burnham's my favorite of you know in of focus characters in Star Trek. I think maybe Discovery is my favorite Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And I it's think definitely it's definitely mine. Yeah. I think it's because she's messy. You know, Burnham's messy. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it really isn't until the third season that she figures out her shit. Mm -hmm. um, but also, she's incredibly confident throughout. She gives great speeches. She's uh, a xeno anthropologist, which often comes in handy in the plots. Uh, but she also gets in her own way in a, in a really interesting way. Yeah, some of us people who are kind of like fucked up, but highly competent and smart, like we need more role <laughs> models than media. <laughs> we need more Michaels. <laughs> so you don't think that Michael has always done everything right? Well, here's the thing. Michael's messy. And, um, you know, I think... What I want to talk about with Michael is very interrelated with all of the things that you brought up. Um, because the the sort of um, touchstone sentence for me from the episode was, I trust you with my life, Commander Burnham, but it doesn't change the fact that you're lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the first descriptor of her that we get outside of just seeing her. Um, and so I think her being lost is an important um part of what these two episodes are about and that doesn't change i've already watched up to episode four she's <laughs> still lost and i think a lot of this is really going to interrelate with her relationship with Lorca, which gregory said earlier that Lorca is immediately known to be a villain and I did feel that in my rewatch of it. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a pretty villainous speech he just gave and some pretty villainous actions he just did. I didn't perceive him that way on my original watch of the show. Like, Interesting. Isn't it the end of the third episode where, like, we see him walking through a museum of of monstrous animals and... 
uh, he has a bunch of weapons, and in the very next yeah. episode, he explains to Burnham, I'm studying war, and it seems very reasonable. They are at war. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess the thing is, I guess my, uh, my counterpoint about Lurka is that if you really think about some of our previous captains more like from a modern like how we might think about things they're kind of monstrous too right cisco is is the one that comes to mind for me or he's like the dancing with the the pale moonlight is that the the episode or he yeah in so, galactic fraud so i know when i was watching discovery the first time i thought oh they're doing a thing with Lorca. they're exploring this dark side of captains right mm -hmm. but i didn't necessarily think he was going to be a villain um, I thought, I really, I guess I was right there with Burnham. I was hoping, I knew, I was like, oh, well, it's not Giorgio, which is what I wanted, but maybe this will be interesting and complicated. So, I don't know. Anyway, I want to talk more about Michael, and it's not even about that. Um, <laughs> I think it was really interesting because Michael understands the Klingons, both logically and emotionally. And although both Sarek and Giorgio suggest that she's biased because the Klingons killed her parents, Michael is... 100% right about them. Tacoma is attempting to unify the Klingons. He does view the Federation as an enemy, and there is nothing Giorgio can say to reflect him. In fact, Giorgio is already doomed to inspire war because Tacoma has already set the stage by taunting the only thing it's possible for Giorgio to say, we come in peace, right? He has already set the Klingons up to interpret that as, an, as, a, as a statement of um, weakness mm -hmm. and that they are their enemies. Uh, so Michael is right about the Klingons. Michael, however, is wrong. She attempts to persuade Giorgio to employ the Vulcan hello, still sounds like a sex thing to me, <laughs> and smack Klingons first and then demand their respect. And it might have worked, considering what we know about Tecovma's rhetorical moves. But Michael, unable to pers persuade Giorgio, attacks her and commits mutiny instead. She's so convinced of her rightness that she thinks she is valuing an eco ethical choice to save lives over a bureaucratically principled right choice. And here, Michael is right. <laughs> As large institutions, the Federation and Starfleet value chain of command and order over right choices. It's a theme of Star Trek, time mm -hmm. and time again. People, usually captains, have to decide when to follow the prime directive and when to say fuck it. Kirk's whole steez is breaking the rules. Every other captain, at some point or another, defies Starfleet, which at times including eventually in Discovery, will be an antagonist of the show. Mm -hmm. But this is where Michael is wrong. Although Tecovma <laughs> has leveraged, I know, although Tecovma has leveraged, we come in peace as a counterpoint to remain Klingon. Here, both Michael and Tecovma are wrong. To remain Klingon is not only to employ violence, something that Discovery and the show Picard will later explore. It's a wrong dichotomy and one that Tecovma is employing in the interest of accruing power. And it's essential to the mission and the very existence of the Federation that they come in peace. Even if Giorgio believes Michael to be factually correct, and I think she does, Starfleet, unlike Han Solo, doesn't shoot first. The question before Giorgio is the analog of Tecovma's exhortation to remain Klingon. She must remain Starfleet, not because it's in their nature, which is the argument Michael makes about Klingon hostility, but because being Starfleet is a choice and one that Giorgio and anybody else makes continuously. This argument about the Federation is crucial to the main conflict of Discovery Season 1. What does it mean to be the Federation, right? I mean, that's going to be a crucial question, I think, mm -hmm. that Season 1 is going to ask us. I won't, I'm not going to give a big spoiler, I guess, before the season, but it becomes the sort of crucial crux of the season. And then where are those intersections of personal and institutional identity, right? So I... Michael is such a complex tragedy, right? These two episodes are a tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, she is in this high position at the beginning, and by the end, she has fallen, you know, really through her own hubris as far as she can possibly go. And Discovery will end up being, you know, a redemption arc for her. Um, and it's going to be perfect for Burnham and Lorca. Like, they're contrasting, I think, um, identities. Uh, and I'm really curious what y'all think about that, too, and uh, about what y'all think about Burnham's complexity, because I just can't think of any other examples of this. Like, it's so good to me. It's so meaty. It's so interesting. Yeah, I, I think you're right about, I think you're right that 
Burnham's analysis of the situation is correct. Um, I think that her, what she tries to do is probably the wrong move, right? Probably shooting for the neck of the ship and attempting to essentially destroy the ship is probably not the right move. But if she had successfully convinced Giorgio to like fire warning shots or fire, like disable the ship's engines, then especially early on, then Takuvma would not have been able to get the great houses to to like seed that idea of we come in peace to the great houses. The ships would have arrived and seen uh, an ancient Federation ship chasing around Takuvma's ship, and they would have been like, oh yeah, Takuvma being a wacko again, and probably the <laughs> war wouldn't have started. Uh, and it's, but like, she does get in her own way there. Burnham, be, I think Burnham does her her resentment towards the Klingons is what makes her too vehement and uh, too absolutist in that approach. Instead of like suggesting a milder way of of starting that diplomatic move. Yeah, like, okay, so she calls Sarek privately to find out how the Vulcans did a thing. Mm-hmm. That is almost definitely documented somewhere. Why didn't she assemble a proposal real quick just google what did how did diplomats handle the klingons over the last 150 years or include Giorgio on that call right she clearly knows sarek and trusts him right mm-hmm. um so instead of taking any kind of like professional approach i mean this is her she's literally at work mm-hmm. you don't hair all over the place and and you know hoot and holler at your boss in public places like it's just weird. Uh, she had other options and chose the most off the cuff one. I think she did, but I am not sure that Giorgio didn't get all of that. Like, I think Giorgio understood that it was possible that they could save maybe this literal situation, maybe, maybe smacking the Klingons in that moment could have, they could have not had this battle. But then what what does that make the Federation if they are going to preemptively shoot at people because they think they might do something? I think the argument of this show is going to be that that would be a very bad organizational <laughs> decision. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's what's the sort of interesting complexity of it, right? Like, because Burnham could save people's lives, but sometimes saving people's lives is not sufficient if you're going to create a fascist state, <laughs> yeah. you know? And it's it's worth noting, Takuvma is fascist. Like, Takuvma is arguing for a fascist thing. He's saying external forces are coming to destroy our our pure way of life, which the pure way of life he's talking about is one which never has existed and is not mm-hmm. widespread. So there is no mm-hmm. way of life there to destroy. And he's appealing to you know, nationalism and the like, unification of disparate identities as a single identity. Straight up fascist. And that's kind of what Burnham's sort playing of, against. Sort of. I think it's more complicated than that. Which I guess goes is part of my topic. But I do think the Klingon stance is... It might be... It is fascist, but it, I don't think it is that... I don't think it's unifying quite that way. I guess maybe a good segue into your topic, <laughs> which will be interesting, <laughs> is I think Discovery in some ways is the most fraught culturally of Star Trek. A lot of people say that it's woke. Um, yep. And I think that comes from a lot of different places. Um, mm-hmm. Some of it just because, you know, we we had at the beginning of the show is what a full, I don't know, five minutes of television. And there's no white men to be seen, right? Like, <laughs> um <laughs> So I, that's just a real, I think, a super superficial level. I think if, you know, an examination of the Klingons there and that whole remain Klingon, um, like if you think about the year when this came out, I mean, mm-hmm. some of the cultural reverberations of what was being called on here. Like, I think there are a lot of reasons why Discovery occupies such a really fraught um, place in our sort of conversations around Star Trek. Um, and why, like, Strange New Worlds doesn't occupy that kind of (laughs) conversation. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm eager to talk about the Federation some more. (laughs) Excellent. All right. So I want to talk about the Federation as a colonialist threat Mm -hmm. to the Klingons, specifically, but also 
writ large as it's uh as i was thinking through stuff we've talked about on the podcast before and things we haven't um it these themes are obviously going to come up again and again but sort of setting the stage here it's come up but the klingon empire at this point is in disarray the 24 great houses are not unified Mm -hmm. suggesting that either there's just a bunch of subcultures doing their own thing and society as a whole is not moving in a particular direction at a minimum it sounds like maybe they are not continuing to expand or are maybe concerned they can't hold their borders or something Mm -hmm. um it's been about a hundred years since there's been a ton of contact and Takuvma has this goal of unifying the houses by setting up federation as a common enemy right and he says this is why we gather to assemble our people to lock arms against those whose fatal greeting is we come in peace and the threat there isn't violence it's assimilation Mm -hmm. it's a loss of identity and i think i disagree maybe with both of you that i don't think when when they say remain klingon i don't think they mean a single thing like a singular thing i agree i think takuvma means one thing but i think the other people are hearing a bunch of different things right and i think takuvma knows they are hearing a bunch of different things like i think everyone is like it is burnham who is saying it is in klingon's nature to be quote-unquote relentlessly hostile Mm -hmm. um the Klingons are saying, we have a guiding light, it is Kalos, and we value our independence, and we do not want to end up like the humans, the Andorians, so on and so forth. Um, I think it is more complex than just like, I think some of the previous portrayals of Klingons in Star Trek have been messy, right? Um, and I'll talk more about Klingons specifically later and what this is doing there, but I think by the ways in which this is kind of opening up sort of that internal, those internal politics of Klingonness and saying like, hey, work has to be done to unify. It's doing an interesting job of setting up those politics of like, what is fascism? Is this fascism? Is the Federation fascist? Um, So the Klingons don't have as reductive a definition of themselves, but they also don't really give one. They Mm -hmm. don't sit and say here are a list of our traits and these are the things we must have and it being anything other than sort of some rituals and a and a a, a guiding light but burnham comes across like when she talks about the relentless hostility and they're violent and so on and so forth not only does she sound reductive she sounds borderline bigoted right to to, I think, probably Mm -hmm. our ears, um, even as people who like Star Trek. (laughs) She does have a line where where someone, I think the Admiral is Uh like, how can you call an entire race that way? And she says, with respect, it would be unwise to confuse race and culture. Yes. Um, So I I think that she at least is telling herself that she's talking about Klingon society and not Mm -hmm. Klingon's inherent nature. But also, she's definitely prejudging. Right. And you can't, like, Star Trek is, is so prone to having monocultures among mm-hmm. its aliens that I think that's, I think that's silly writing to, to throw that in there. It's, it's <laughs> cute writing. It's, I think it's them going, yeah, we know. Yeah. We know. But we're, we're Star Trek. Mm-hmm. I think, like, I mean, to me, Takovma is, I think he is, I think he is leveling this thing, this kind of tight motto, remain clinging on in his attempt to be powerful. And I think that Tukovma himself is a problematic figure of the Klingons. I, and I think he and Burnham are parallel to each other in that they are both, they both espouse really problematic perspectives on Klingons. Um, I, I think he's appealing to real concerns and uh and problems that the Kling- other klingons see in service of his own project which is one of forwarding a very specific and idiosyncratic view of what the right sort of klingon is right like mm-hmm. you don't yeah. get 
Takuma probably doesn't think much of a Klingon opera singer. He probably doesn't think much of, you know, the person who seeks honor by uh, fixing ships. Takuma wants all Klingons to be people who fight and kill on the front lines. Maybe. I don't think we have evidence for that. Like, he talks about if a warrior dies in bed, so on and so forth, but I don't Mm -hmm. think he's talking about all Klingons. And another thing that I'm that I might be a difference in reading here, and this is not me being some sort of Takuma stand by any means, mm-hmm. like, fuck him, but I don't think he is trying to rule the Klingons. That wasn't my read. My read is that he is truly trying to unify the Great Houses, and maybe that's the difference here. <laughs> Something to note, uh, mm-hmm. Takuma's moniker that he has assigned is Takuma the Unforgettable. I thought that was Kalesh the Unforgettable. Kalesh is also the Unforgettable. Oh, Vocal right, yes, he said that. Voke, he said he, he was reincarnated. Yeah, Voke mm-hmm. deems, or dubs, uh, Takuvma as the unforgettable, the reincarnation of Kalash, who is mm-hmm. Jesus, right? He's the, the spiritual yeah. and and philosophical leader of all Klingons. He's Confucius and Jesus rolled into one. Uh, yeah. Takuvma's, like, when, when Kalash shows sure. up much, much later, a clone of Kalash, they make him the leader of the Empire immediately. He ends up as a oh. figurehead, but, like... He is, he is mm, yeah, wanting to right. be emperor. You're right. He is. Uh, I mean, he's also employing violence. I mean, he, and, and seems to be making an argument for violence being a part of Klingonness mm-hmm. as part of mm-hmm. forwarding his own means, which mm-hmm. doesn't seem like, I don't know, that seems problematic. And because Burnham does the same thing. She talks about hostility being a part of that as well. And and I was thinking, because we were just watching Picard <laughs> season three, mm-hmm. and you see, you see such a complex wharf, you know, who has mm-hmm. really, like, <laughs> he talks about meditation and, you know, it's not just about violence. Like he has, he, he's clearly thinking about, he is, he has remained Klingon, but he doesn't have to accept these kind of stereotype, typical or, um, I'm not sure stereotypical um, ideas about Klingonness in order to do that. So that's what I was thinking about when now when I was hearing Takovma was thinking about Worf. But I I do think you're right, Lissa, that the problems that Takovma is using to forward his agenda are real problems. Yeah, and I think that I think there is a big difference between an outside group saying these people are relentlessly violent. It's their nature. Mm -hmm. And Klingons, the people saying we will employ violence in order to achieve our goals. And that like fuck a fascist, but that particular component Mm -hmm. is, it is very different coming from Burnham than it is coming from the people themselves self-identifying. Yeah. Um, and I think tying into that, like in our episode on SCP-6001 Avalon, mm-hmm. I talked about like how cops talk, how jailers talk. Mm-hmm. And jailers, you know, identify people as threats or not threats and put them in boxes and slap labels on them and say, how do we deal with this? How do we systematize and, you know, put these people into boxes? And that is a lot of how Burnham is talking in this mm-hmm. episode about Klingons is like, Let's run to the textbook, Sarek, who will tell us how to handle this. And Sarek is like, that situation is different than the one you're in. Like, you can't mm-hmm. save lives that are already gone. Like, and you know, she should be know careful. better. She's a xenoanthropologist. She, she should fucking know better, right? Um, and she still behaves this way. And this is tangled up in the stuff y'all have already talked about, about her history and her looking for these guiding stars and makes me think about the time I followed too many people's advice trying to bake my first turkey and ended up with a mess uh, where I took three or four different techniques and combined them and came out with something inedible. Uh, That is kind of what Burnham is doing Mm -hmm. (laughs) to a certain extent. Um, So, yeah. So I think this is one of the relatively few times we see a powerful society, an empire, crumbled though it is, taking a stance that is, hey, Federation, we see you as a colonialist Mm -hmm. threat. They talk about your borders are too close to ours, but the real fear is us getting assimilated. Um, 
and I think that's really interesting. I, I think it's a, a fair point. And, you know, the Federation is, you know, I, I wish they had pointed to examples of like, hey, these specific people lost these components of their identity, but it wasn't that kind of dramatic thing that they were doing. Um, but yeah. yeah, this is a thing that shows up way, way later in the continuity uh, in late Next Generation with uh, Cardassians and the Maquis mm-hmm. and the the quote-unquote colonists who some of whom don't want to be part of the federation because of the way the federation policies are colonial and empirical and and imperial rather than Mm -hmm. actually looking at the needs of individual uh settlements and the klingons never do join the federation do they in our uh history it's there's a there's a early on in next generation there are a few lines that imply they do but that's retconned away um they Mm -hmm. might as of the future in discovery they might at some point have signed on but i don't remember i don't remember them ever mentioning it specifically yeah i know up until maybe the events of picard which would be the latest we go as until we have the discovery jump I don't think Klingons are part of the Federation. Yeah. Good for them. I like the Federation, but good for the Klingons. Yep. Klingons, Romulans. Yeah. They be sovereign. I don't know about the Romulans, but (laughs) Romulan government's fucked up. Klingon government seems all right. All these, nah, all these governments are fucked up. All right. With the main topics covered, it's time for a quick lightning round of other interesting things we spotted. I think that uh, we've talked about it a little bit, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into like the concept of war and honor that get tossed around. I think that that um, Giorgio is portrayed as a soldier, as a at least a former soldier, and I don't know if we know what war she fought in. But she specifically seem, it seems to be someone with personal experience of war. Um, she quotes Sun Tzu at one point, uh, and um, she says, Battle is not a simulation. It's blood and screams and funerals. And mm-hmm. then later, after the, um, the initial attack has happened, and Connor, that, that he's a lieutenant, he's a, he's a young officer, um, mm-hmm like has gotten a concussion and Burnham's in the brig and Connor wanders in and seems to think he's going to medical, but he's, his head's been hit hard enough that he it doesn't even know where he is. And he says, uh, why are we fighting? We're Starfleet. We're explorers, not soldiers. And then the room explodes and he's sucked out into space and dies. And this, this show is saying war is bad right which is not a controversial statement it's not a particularly deep one but it's also kind of saying like there it seems to think that there are proper ways to to fight and that to fight and think that it is noble is wrong um but also presumably i I think that the show would say that war has principles and Likewise, the Klingons talk a lot about honor and about the idea, you know, like there, there are good and bad ways to fight and good and bad ways to engage in diplomacy. And yet, if we look at the stuff that actually happens in this battle, we see Takuvma accepting a ceasefire and then attacking from hiding. So breaking the flag of ceasefire, which is, inc- it would be considered incredibly dishonorable in our modern society. We mm-hmm. see... Uh, <laughs> we see Giorgio and Burnham without anyone saying, "Hey, should we do this?" They put a bomb in a corpse that is being collected for funeral, which mm-hmm. I had to look this up. So, this is not actually against the Geneva Convention. It is, however, <laughs> against a convention that happened in Geneva uh, in 1980, the violation of the United Nations Convention on certain conventional weapons, Protocol Two, Article Six, Section One B Two uh says that you cannot use booby traps uh in connection with but the bodies of the dead um and now that's a un convention the federation is not the un but presumably this is a literal war crime uh under the rules and no one has a second thought 
And the motivation for this attack is either revenge for the attack, because at this point the battle's over. There's no more fighting. Bodies are being collected. There's no suggestion that Tukuvma's going to come around and kill people. Uh, and they're, they want to capture Tukuvma, but like doing a tactic like that in order to capture someone seems pretty bad. And then on a very low level, the final killing of Tukuvma, uh, Burnham shoots him in the back. She literally shoots him in the back. He is he is fighting. He is actively engaged in fighting Giorgio. And Burnham shoots him, phaser on kill, not on stun, in the back when she's supposed to be capturing him. And so, like... After she was the one who convinced Giorgio that yes. that's what they should do. Yeah, because mm-hmm. presumably she's angry about him killing Giorgio. And, like, and as a result, they're unable to recover Giorgio's body because of all the chaos. Um, oh, and do you know what happens to her body? I don't remember. Oh, they eat her. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because huh. yep. there's, yeah, it's fucked up. Yeah, it's real um, fucked up. So, like, the show has all these people talking about how war, either war should be avoided or there's a proper way to do war. But as soon as the battle starts, all of those principles seem to go away. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I I was like, is this is this what Klingon honor is? Like, clearly this is not Federation principles. But is this dishonorable behavior for the Klingons or is it honorable? And I'm like, what is what are the Klingon rules of honor? And I mm-hmm. tried to look and I couldn't find it. But I did find a discussion of honor uh, and what honor actually means, um, or at least what we think honor means. Um, so there's a there's this Orientalist book about Japanese culture called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword by an anthropologist mm-hmm. named Ruth Benedict. Um, it's There's a lot of issues with it. Um, it's kind of conflating it's doing the same thing burnham does and taking a a subset of japanese culture from the world war ii era very narrow time and a very narrow Mm. class and projecting it onto all of japanese culture and it causes a has a bunch of other problems but but it's definitely in the in the air and in the way that people are thinking about honor when they're writing about the klingons and um it also introduces or it popularizes this idea of um, guilt cultures versus honor shame cultures. And the, it, the way it defines it, kind of American uh, wasp culture uh, is, and, and especially, uh, yeah, especially like northern culture, because it gets more complicated in, in the south of the U.S., um, is, an, is a guilt culture. You decide how to act based on what you think is right, based on your own personal conscience, um, out of you know thought that you will be punished in hell, or 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 out of like this this, this thought that you are less than if you do wrong, um, and that like if you do do wrong, you should uh, confess and make amends. Right. That's that's sort of the the guilt culture according to to Benedict's framing, and then an honor culture which is balanced you know an honor shame culture uh you decide how to act based on how others will perceive you so honor in that way is something is honorable if when you do it people think you're cool people think you have done right Mm -hmm. um and so it's it means that like in a shame-based culture by, by this definition there aren't principles as such it's if you do a thing will others think you were cool in whatever that means would others think you were good what other things you were doing well and would they respond well and would it improve your reputation and so for for the klingons like if this is how takuvma frames honor then as long as he's appearing good appearing powerful appearing strong appearing klingon to the other klingons it doesn't matter what he does he can he can attack from hiding he can do a sneak attack and maybe he wouldn't think that booby trapping a corpse would be a bad thing even though yeah. they have very strong klingons definitely have strong and and deeply held funereal beliefs he might think well that was an impressive move and if everyone saw that and thought it was fine maybe that's fine for klingon culture um and i think that maybe the klingons come off better in terms of like their own relative morals than the federation does here right because the klingons are being consistent in their moral framework whereas the federation is saying oh we're as bad we should avoid its blood and funerals and then immediately disrupt a funeral with a bomb Mm -hmm. 
and also it is interestingly um it fit into the idea of of the federation as a particular kind of colonizer for them to be like yeah let's take this religious ceremony of these people and fuck it up mm -hmm. like <laughs> just like yeah let's just booby trap this uh yeah Tukuma i think is you're literally right. saying a prayer or a sermon as they're loading the bomb onto her corpse yeah i feel like one thing that for me complicates it a bit is saru because saru is the one who comes up with this plan um of the photon torpedo um i think maybe both versions of it um and I, you know i think it's i think it's the the corpse idea is either burnham or Giorgio. yeah saru right. comes up with the send a bomb on mm -hmm. idea. um and you know saru is a really interesting character when I mean, we find out more about kelpians as discovery goes on but he um i mean his his kelpians are um prey you know mm -hmm. and I, maybe they talk about it in one of these episodes or maybe it's yeah, one that i, I watched ahead on um so he thinks differently than a soldier like Giorgio or later Lorca will, um, or any of the, um, I think Klingon soldiers as well. And he also thinks differently than scientists, um, who would ostensibly like be like Burnham, right. Um, mm -hmm. as a scientist, I mean, he is thinking, I, you know, if I am significantly weaker, <laughs> what can I do to not get it? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I never could evolve a real theme around the idea of consumption, but I did think about it when I've learned that um, they consumed Giorgio's body um, and then thinking about the Kelpians too mm. and Saru's concerns, um, which make him to me a really interesting character um, and how Giorgio takes him really seriously, which is not always the case with Lorca. Mm. Um, so I don't know. It complicates it for me um saru's position in it um because i don't think he's thinking like a soldier i don't think he cares about honor mm -hmm. um when yeah. Giorgio says why don't you go with burnham and he's like uh no thank you <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, <that's, laughs> and, she's, and she's like would you ever yeah like no i don't know <laughs> of course i wouldn't want to do that yeah so he's a different kind of character than maybe other characters in star trek are <laughs> yeah another interesting character <laughs> might be Sarek. Um, I think Sarek, you know, his appearance is interesting because we've met him before lots of times. I think we mm -hmm. certainly see him in, um, original Star Trek and he's definitely on Next Generation. Mm -hmm. He shows up in at least some of the movies. Um, mm -hmm. maybe Deep Space Nine? Is there a Sarek maybe. episode? Yeah. I mean, I feel like he knows everybody. Uh. He's an ambassador, right? That's, that's why he gets mm -hmm. around. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He's just sort of a perpetual presence. Um, but I'm not, I mean, you know, I'm sure it's a lot really interesting to think about Saru's history. Um, I'm really interested in evaluating Sarek as a dad. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm really just going to be evaluating him as Michael's dad. Because <laughs> I don't think we can get into Spock without, like, going off the rails. It's complicated. Yeah. So, um... I have a little bit of a hobby of evaluating dads in media. <laughs> uh, and so to in order to be um, considered in this analysis of dads, you do have to be like a definite dad. You don't have to be a biological dad, but you do have to be assuming the role of dad. And you also have to know about and have interactions with your child. So there's the rules of the game. Here's the spectrum. The spectrum is... From one, on one end of the spectrum is the worst dad that you can possibly think of. And that's Gon's dad from the anime Hunter Hunter. Ging freaks. Ging, Ging is the worst dad. He does know about his son. He does believe his son will be successful. He absolutely does nothing to contribute to that success in any way. And is just an absolute <laughs> just jerk. And actively avoids helping his son. And actively avoids even being in the presence of his son. Does not want anything to do with him. Avoids it at all costs. And then on the other end of the spectrum, also from an anime, which is Dr. Stone, which Liz is in the midst of watching. And that's Sinku's dad, who's the best dad in all of history. 
not a biological dad, but a dad nonetheless, who believes in his son so much and contributes (laughs) in absolutely practical ways to the success of that son down to his last breath. With absolutely no evidence that his efforts will ever result in anything except his faith in his son. Except for his absolute unassailable belief in his son. So those are the rules of the game. What do we think about Sarek as a dad? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll do I'll do a con and a pro. Con, entirely emotionally unavailable, clearly feels things but is unable to express them and, and deliberately refuses to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, on a pro, uh, he is so concerned with Michael's uh, well-being that he endures actual physical damage in order to communicate her via a shard of his soul that he placed inside her in order to preserve her life as a child. And Lissa used as their entry um, uh, if a death was necessary, I am satisfied it was not yours, right? He's like, you had to defend yourself. I'm glad you do what you got (laughs) to do. Now, I will say this portrayal of Sarek is positively warm and fuzzy. So (laughs) the completely emotionally unavailable and unwilling to express it, I think this guy is practically gave her a hug every time they interacted <laughs> relative to original series Sarek, who amazing actor all you know pluses down the line not not this warm and fuzzy um i think he's a good dad i think he's the best dad Sarek has ever been in star trek <laughs> yes like yeah I, on a scale I, of Sarek to Sarek, this guy definitely <laughs> yes. is Sarek. yeah he's high <laughs> Sarek. this is peak <laughs> Sarek. <laughs> I did like that moment whenever he's leaving Burnham the first time and he's like, behave. Yes. (laughs) And I do believe this is the best delivery of live long and prosper because he absolutely (laughs) delivers it as a threat. You will live long and prosper. (laughs) He delivered it in the most dad Uh, manner. (laughs) That actor did amazing things with that character, quite frankly. Like, he has embodied it in a way, both both Sarek and Amanda, I think, in the show, um, become people in a way that there wasn't often room for them to in their previous mm-hmm. appearances in Star Trek. And Sarek is a good dad, I think. Sarek's... Well, you know, flawed, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, in this episode, at least, he comes across very well. His, his final send-off in that long-distance mind meld is... Did you think I came here just to say farewell? I would not put my well-being at risk for such sentimentality. What I cannot abide is a waste of resources. You are gifted. You are brave. You must do better because I know you can. Yeah, it's real good. That's real belief in your mm-hmm. offspring sort of stuff. But... Real Byakuya behavior. He did give up her seat at, you know, the thing she wanted mm-hmm. to do for Spock, who mm-hmm. did not want to do it. Yep. Which That's is not discussed shitty. in this episode. Right. It is yep. not, but it, we do have to, like, it is sort of implied in, like, when he brings her to the ship. I mean, I think the, it's, maybe it resonates there. Maybe it's not yeah, he's, the word. He's clearly kind of forcing her to take this position. She doesn't want it. And he, she, yeah. he's bringing yeah. her there anyway. I don't think the Spock connection comes up until a later episode. We do see that he absolutely does not get her any treatment whatsoever for her obvious PTSD. She's having flashbacks Mm -hmm. in class, and he's just like, you good? You should (laughs) be. Pull it together. Yeah. Oh, and if we pull Spock into this, Sarek is not a great dad. No, Sarek's a real bad dad (laughs) to Spock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So, but for the sake of these episodes on the dad scale, this is peak Sarek. At, at least yeah yeah i will say i think i will i would judge him as best dad Sarek has been or and mm-hmm. will be mm-hmm. <laughs> will have been and but i'd only give him probably like a i don't think he's on the the gones dad side but i only give him maybe like a quarter or a tenth of Sinku's dad yeah so just only a little smidge of um awesome dad yeah. so I want to critique some writing in this episode. Mm. And we've already kind of done it a little bit. 
And it's about stuff we've already talked about. But, you know, one of the things we talked about with First Contact was sort of how Star Trek struggles with ideas of exceptionalism versus systems in play Mm -hmm. and things like that. And I had, I had been curious coming back into Discovery and also kind of knowing where it goes. What is it going to look like here? We have the start of a war. Mm-hmm. Who, what systems are at play here? And I think this writing is an absolute mess on this front. Be- part of it is because we, are, we have Burnham as the point of view character. So they, the, the show wants her to be important and mm-hmm. wants her to be pivotal. And she is to a certain extent, right? But... This, you know, we have Burnham here who is saying, you know, I'm guided by the principles of the Federation and Starfleet. I'm also guided by my love of you and the crew Um, to Giorgio. uh, We have, you know, this uh, Takuvma set up as a very important figure. There is the implication that he is going to be able to revolutionize, or at least some of this work is going to succeed at revolutionizing Klingon society. But we also have, like, This, like, what we've talked about with, like, what is honor? What are the principles? How are we handling war? And how much of where it goes wrong in this episode is because Star Trek and the Federation have it wrong and never actually do what they say they will versus these people in these seats right now messing it up. I think the writers don't know. Mm -hmm. I think the writers are coming at this from all angles and firing all these shots. And I think even... Even in that conversation with the Admiral, where Burnham throws out that line, it would be unwise to confuse race with culture, is one of those, like a little snippet thrown in there to make it sound like Burnham is doing something clever and broad with her opinions on things. Um, When in fact, I don't think it's that clever, right? She's, Mm -hmm. I think she's tripping over her own feet on this. Um, And it was frustrating. It was frustrating because of the way that Discovery is so modern in a lot of other ways um, with lots of femme people and queer people and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, It was one of those things where I was like, oh, I'll come back to this. And like, as much as I do love these episodes and I do love the show, it didn't nail that at all. Um, And I think, I think they could have, like, I think they could have, especially on the Federation side, like the Klingon side, I think is a little better. We see, we have a, a sense of the disarray. We have a sense of the fascism happening here and what quote unquote unification means. Um, but the Federation side is just a mess. It's just people bumbling around and acting as if, you know, the Federation has their back or doesn't have their back or, or whatever. So anyway, it was frustration. Um, I think I think it's just a bit of messy writing there. Yeah, the, the characters like in episode three, say, definitely seem to believe that Burnham caused the war. Mm-hmm. And while it's true that she did kill the the torchbearer, uh, stage a mutiny at exactly the wrong time, thus distracting <laughs> Giorgio during the initial attack, and uh, basically get Giorgio killed and create a martyr. Also, mm-hmm. this would this have happened if it had been a different ship? Probably. How would th- they wouldn't have turned out very differently? I think it's clear, though, in the next episode that they're wrong about Burnham. Like, that the, yeah. the things that they don't, that they think Burnham caused are really not the problems mm-hmm. with what Burnham, you know what I mean? Yeah. And one of the quotes I wrote down and then shuffled out of my list is uh, Giorgio saying, this is the Federation, we don't retreat. Something along those lines of, like, we are not leaving this space because it's our space. Yeah. Like, What? It's like, like why not? She there's a there's not? a line where she's like, <laughs> we need to make sure to protect these other sites. Yes. But like, why not retreat to the most vulnerable one of those and then let the exactly. other ships protect those? And you know, you don't need to protect this empty binary star system. Yeah, there's a whole lot of the Federation is this. We you know we do this, we do that, um, and yet I don't know. So again, it's it's Star Trek doing that, but I feel like this is worse than. It's messier than First Contact, where we also kind of looked at that and were like, ah, come on. So, in addition to the deep stuff, we're also all big Star Trek fans. So let's head to 10 Forward to talk about stuff we geeked out about. I am going to start with weird Klingon shit. Y'all, 
pump this weird Klingon shit directly into my veins. I love it. I love it so much. These are some of the weirdest <laughs> fucking Klingons we have gotten. It's outstanding. They have, uh, we see a ton of diversity visually. We mm-hmm. see people with different, completely different types of forehead ridges. Completely different we skull see... shapes. Some of them yeah. have create mm-hmm. like the back of their skull goes back laurel a character shows up in the background here and is prominent later her head changes shape over the course of the series yeah uh these Klingons don't have hair mm-hmm. at all don't know if that's cultural or biological who could say uh there's just a ton of difference here i get the strong impression from that scene when the when all the house leaders show up that maybe mm-hmm. the each klingon house has diverged in appearance Yes. Since they've split. Because they each kind of look distinctly different from each other. And then Takuma's group is very distinct because he takes in outcasts. And so they've got mm-hmm. people from all over. That's what I thought too. And something that, that was interesting to me is that like, whenever, when these shows have come out, when Star Trek 2009, the movie came mm-hmm. out, there have all, and I guess Star Trek Enterprise had this problem too, of writing prequels. And mm-hmm. you're like, people were like, oh, you completely changed how Vulcans work in Enterprise. Now the women have Ponfar or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are like, they, you, you can't do that. And it's like, well, if anyone can, they can because it's their fucking show, mm-hmm. right? But Vulcans are a space for some reason where like people get really, really like tense about what Vulcans should and shouldn't be. And it's really next gen DS9 is where they should be. Um I, str- I have struggled with that as well, but Klingons, this mess of Klingons having completely smooth heads in original series, the same Klingons coming back in later series and having forehead ridges, and like, we know the practicalities of it being a matter of makeup and technology at the time and all sorts of stuff, um, but like, who cares? Like, I love it. And them just coming right out of the gate in the first Star Trek to exist in X number of years and being like here, have some Klingons, and they're going to talk differently. They're going to look very different. Uh, It's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. They've got these weird flat noses. Yep. Uh, Oh, the kind of double nostrils. Yeah. Really interesting visually. Very protruding Mm -hmm. jaws. Like, they look alien in a way Klingons never have. Yes. And that, that diversity of Klingons reminds me of one of my favorite Klingon moments in the entire show. I may have mentioned it before on this podcast before, but <laughs> there's a time Worf uh, is like, peace, uh, maybe Jizia is giving Worf a hard time for being very serious. And Worf is like, Klingons do not laugh. And Jizia is like, yes, they do. Klingons <laughs> laugh all the time. What are you talking about? You don't know Klingons. Like, right. they're, they're, they've always been diverse in a way that many cultures haven't been on Star Trek. Yeah. In part because we've seen different versions of them throughout time. Mm-hmm. I loved that they had so much Klingon language mm-hmm. in it, I yep. think. And that they, you know, they did the subtitles. Um, I thought that oh, was yeah. really cool. That's, I mean, I love that language shit, so. Yeah. Yeah. This is the first time we see this particular kind of ritual around death. I think that in Star Trek normally up to this point, uh, Klingons are pretty, uh, are are less concerned with bodies after death. Yes. They they do the shout for the soul, but Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And here they have that ship that has, according to Saru, bodies that are possibly thousands of years old on it. Yeah, as armor. The armor yeah. of the ship is made up of coffins. That's fucking metal. That's so cool. Right. And like, who knows if this is something that is a practice that dies out after mm-hmm. this, or if it's a practice that is still happening in the Star Treks we know and just isn't on screen right. because maybe, it's not. <laughs> maybe the Klingons are like, you're doing that funeral ritual? You're feeling a little bit like Takuvma right now. Right. <laughs> Takuvma the forgettable. This cringe guy. <laughs> The one we wish we could forget. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yes, I love it. And this whole series, you know, continues to do weird shit. There's a whole procedure that happens uh, that is, you know, I don't know that anything like it has happened in Star Trek where a species can be changed. There's just all sorts of uh, Klingon shit that goes down. Uh, So, anyway, I love it. That's all. (laughs) My big fan thing is uh, space battles. Uh, 
I'm not a fan of space battles in Star Trek generally. Uh, yeah. Very often in most series, it ends up being like two buildings sitting next to each other going pew, 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 and then cutting to the inside where they say some techno babble and like the battles don't really matter and they're not particularly interesting. And I think a legit criticism of Discovery is that there are kind of action scenes that exist kind of just to be action scenes. Um, Mm -hmm. But these space battles in these episodes are, I think, great. Uh, Every single thing that happens has both significance in the story and is really cool to look at we get the initial attack on on the shenzhou uh where like it people legit get damp they get get hurt in it and like you can see the damage on the ship large scale uh you know the wall of the brig blowing open the ship plummeting towards that asteroid and having to be rescued kind of giving it an excuse to sort of be out of the action for a little while while some of the interpersonal stuff happens and then that just amazing shot of the cloaked ship like plowing through the the what's the admiral's ship um the europa the europa Europa. we start to see the front of the europa buckle and you're like what's happening and then the ship uncloaks as it just cleaves through and then the europa self-destructs and destroys both of the ships and that's weird and badass um amazing we get to see uh the collection of the bodies is is all these ships are are kind of adrift in space we see the escape pods launching out of the shenzhou which is is cool like it's this is this is some of the most exciting space battle i've seen in star trek and like sometimes you get some cool like wrath of khan the star trek 2 the second Mm -hmm. star trek movie has some like submarine style fighting where it's like people trying to figure out their positioning and and so on but this is like direct battle in a way that's really cool and that i don't usually like in star trek Mm -hmm. and given all the lens flares that are in this show Mm -hmm. i was like oh god am i going to be able to stand these battles because i'm not a huge fan of that sort of this this Mm -hmm. thing we're doing in the modern era but the battles were cool as hell. It yeah. was so cool. And like... they're very legible. <laughs> like, there's not, yes. like, a whole lot of shaky cam where you can't figure out what's going on. There's not a whole lot of cutting around. It's very clear what's going on. And what's going on is terrible and cool to look at. Mm-hmm. I don't think this is exactly what you're talking about. But the way they represented the hull damage, you know, with the sort of mm. weird... The mm. force fields keeping in atmosphere in the yeah. places where the hull itself was missing. Like, it looked cool and scary. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. And I I said this earlier, but the shot of Burnham sitting in this brig cell that's isolated in space, again, representing her isolation from the rest of the ship <laughs> in the social context, she convinces the, the, the computer, and then just, like, a circular hole opens up in this force field, and she's launched out by the escaping air across this thing that once was a room and now is open space into what once was a door and now is an airlock super cool amazing is it time to talk about javid iqbal yeah um so this is gonna involve some spoilers for discovery and probably some kind of big ones so i would say this one is a reveal i think this is a legit reveal so if you want to stop here and like skip ahead a couple of minutes yeah we'll say uh, we'll say what we're watching next in the show notes if you, if you <laughs> um yeah if you feel like you have not watched discovery and you want to hold on to this one just don't listen to this part um but it's really fascinating <laughs> um <laughs> because um the the <laughs> actor who plays uh Vogue in mm-hmm. these two episodes is actually shazad latif Um, it's, but the re they also have included in the cast of characters, Javed Iqbal, because they do not want to reveal that Shazad Latif is going to be playing not just to Voak, but later on a different character who is actually also Voak. That's, I guess, (laughs) the, the, the spoiler. Um, but it is a big revelation on the show when that is finally revealed. Um, Voke actually, I mean, for those of you who've listened to or watched Discovery, he actually has really horrific surgery to become mm-hmm. human. Um, and so it is Voke, but he 
is being a human, Ash Tyler. Um, but I think it's the meta part of it that's really fascinating to me because Star Trek, the show, was so determined that it should be a secret and that the reveal was so important that they wanted to have two names to represent those two characters. So Voke is Javed Iqbal and Ash Tyler is Shazad Latif. And it turns out that um, I, apparently Javed Iqbal is Shazad Latif's father, or at least a mm-hmm. spin on his father's name. Um, that he came up with in order to sort of honor his father. Um, And uh, they actually, when they originally cast Latif, they said he was going to be playing Voke. But then a couple of months later, they said, oh, no, never mind. We changed our mind. He's actually going to be playing a human named Ash Tyler. And, you know, because of all the makeup, couldn't do it. And so, you know, got this other person. But I know when I was watching it originally, so this would have been before the reveal, I was sort of, uh, I mean, I just knew that Ash was not who he was supposed to be. And it was, yeah, and I was like, I remember like Googling Javid Iqbal and he has no, like Mm -hmm. there's no IMDB page. (laughs) And I was Mm -hmm. like, are they pulling an elaborate hoax on us? (laughs) And it was kind of like a whole like conspiracy (laughs) theory at the time at one point at some event someone asked uh someone asked latif what's up with javed iqbal and he's like i think i met him once at a party yeah yeah it literally turned out to be a conspiracy Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's very Uh, good yeah so anyway i think it I don't know. I guess I I mean, I think I really appreciate the commitment to the sort of the game of Mm -hmm. it. I don't know. I I don't know if I agree that like hinging so much on a big reveal like that is a a thing maybe a show should put so much energy into. I don't know. know. It seems like a yeah, a lot. (laughs) I, I feel like it doesn't really matter to keep it secret, but I do like that they did it. Like, even if they had just come out and been like, the first time someone was like, Javid Iqbal doesn't exist, they were like, yeah, you're right. We're c- concealing his name. <laughs> like, just just the fact that they do that is cool. It's it's the, that's a paratextual thing. That's the the surrounding parts of the text that aren't really part of the stuff you see on screen outside of the credits, but it's still, like, part of that story in a, in a removed way. Just like an episode title is still important to the episode. And I know I personally end up really loving Voke slash Ash. Uh, <sighs> I can't stand Voke in these episodes. <laughs> so I, I don't remember how we get there. <laughs> but eventually I know I'm going to really love Ash. Yeah. Slash Voke. I mean, by the time he is Ash, the, the show establishes pretty textually that Voke is gone. That Ash yeah. Tyler is a different person now. Yeah. I mean, there's a tragic romance. There yeah. I guess two tragic romances. But, yes. Uh I think Vogue's tragic romance is uh heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Uh so yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe they were like what if, you know, we had really like stuck at the landing with uh two Vix. Uh, oh no yes that was the thought process someone came into the story and said you know it was a great episode of star trek that didn't quite make it and speaking of tuvix now it's time Uh to announce our next episode whoa hold up (laughs) is it time to announce our next episode yeah are we watching tuvix well At the end of each episode, we pick the next thing that we're watching based on a connection from this episode. Uh, I pick this time. It's a total surprise to Melissa and Lucy. I haven't told them yet. So, uh, this two-parter was very interested in the legacy of the historical figure Kalesh, or Kales. So, next time, we are watching the ninth episode of the fourth season of Deep Space Nine. (gasps) <gasps> the Sword of Kalos. Yay! Yes! Worf and Jazia Dax are going to go on a quest to find an ancient weapon with strange powers. Uh, we mentioned the Klingons that appear differently in uh, in original series and in Deep Space Nine. Here is we're going to see 
the most prominent one of them. Fuck yes. Awesome. I'm here for Jadzia and Worf yep. stuff anyway, 100%. So uh, you can get uh, the sort of Kalesh, uh, the sort of Kalesh uh, <laughs> on streaming on Paramount Plus, or you can buy it a whole bunch of places, or, you know, however you want to acquire an episode of Star Trek. It's, you know, we're no cops. So next time we'll be discussing the sort of Kalesh the ninth episode of the fourth season of DS9 on Before the Future Came. You can find links and show notes over at beforethefuture.space. Please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found the show. You can submit questions on cohost at cohost.org slash before the future came. Send us comments on our website or write to us at onscreen at beforethefuture.space. I'm Gregory Avery Weir, and you can find me at ludusnovus.net or on cohost at cohost.org slash G-A-W. I'm Lucy Arnold, and I, when I am inspired, blog at intertextualities.com. And I'm Melissa Avery Weir, and I live at urson.net and on Mastodon as melissa at urson.life. Our music is Let's Pretend by Josh Woodward, used under Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. Thank you for listening. I'm sure we'll all live happily ever after Surrounded by butterflies, children, and laughter It's a fairy tale story, so let's just pretend Hallelujah, amen, it's the end Happily ever after the one of my students asked me who my favorite Star Trek couple was, and they asked me to choose between Picard and Beverly or uh, Riker and um, Troy. What? And I was like, I'm sorry, that's no. <laughs> no. I mean, it's, I've it's got Burnham many other Booker, options. But 100%. But just if you were going to give me. Good. If I'm going to go, yeah, if I'm going to go with Next Generation, I would say Troy and Worf.